the first panel, it's about uh, what we can do together in the field of health. Uh, Markus Hengsteger will chair this panel. Thank you so much, Markus, for doing this job for us. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I interpret my role as taking care that really enough questions are going on here. So I think the first part of the whole panel should be that um, the idea to induce questions. So I ask uh, Pete and Shafi and later on Doris and Hans and Robin to make some inputs, probably a little bit provocative so that we can then start discussing on it in the second part of the panel. And we open the discussion in the second part for everybody. Pete, your turn, your five minutes. Looking forward. The people are starting to realize that their health can be serviced on demand. And that's put a huge strain on a traditional healthcare service, especially the ones that we have set up in the UK. I believe the consumer have just had, in the last five weeks, their 2008 banking moment for healthcare. And the last five or six weeks have been incredibly demanding on the healthcare services, but then it's now being entirely driven by the consumer. It's not being driven by pharmaceutical or traditional uh, medical services, um, which, is, which is amazing. We will not go back in the future. We will not go back to the way healthcare was done before February, uh, January, February, and March this year. It's also exposed from a patient's point of view, and we're hearing this from the front line uh, and also from our own patients, massive inequalities in the healthcare market huge inequalities. The same social inequalities that we knew existed before are now being highly exposed. It's the poor people, it's the socio-deprived um, areas that are still suffering more. The fatalities of COVID are hitting those, society, those areas even harder uh, in this era than, than perhaps we realised. I also believe, and I'm going to throw this in here as a kind of final thought, um, techn technology will not save us from the future. AI and data did not predict that the world was going to hit 13 million cases of a pandemic uh, this time last year. Technology has not uh, you know, prevented COVID from happening. It's servicing the way that it's being treated, but it's not prevented it. Uh, healthcare will change dramatically for the better, I'm hoping. So let's talk about clinics. We're now to virtual clinics, as uh, Peter alluded to earlier. You know, we used to run clinics all the time in my hospital in surgical clinics. Now it's telephone triage, it's virtual clinics. Patients won't need to be coming to hospital anymore. Peter alluded to social care. I totally agree. Social care has been uh, found out big time. Lack of investment in the UK, lack of support. Um, and, f and we're suddenly realising, actually, we don't put enough uh, resources into managing social care better. So hopefully that will come out of this kind of um, conversation over the next few months uh, with governments around the world all trying to figure out that kind of uh, inequity of, of care. Technology aside, and we, I think technology has been useful. I agree with Pete in certain areas. I think it's been found out a little bit. But we don't have the right data. We haven't collected enough data. We've seen the difference in governments creating the testing and, and looking at social contacts and tracing, etc. It hasn't done uniformly. What's been transparent here is that we're not listening to the global community. I've been saying this constantly. This is a global pandemic requiring global solutions and global data, which hasn't happened. Each country has taken unique um, uh, stances, etc. It'd be great if we could actually work together as a community. As we are, for example, crowdsourcing ventilators, crowdsourcing 3D printed PPE, for example. Actually, what about the overall agenda? Is there a way we can manage the pandemic better in the future? Right? I think that COVID-19 makes a significant impact on many people's mental health. What we know from data till now is that in the United States, Europe and also in Canada, um, anxiety and depressive symptoms uh, increased associated with COVID-19. What we have seen is that in the US, the number of prescriptions uh, for antidepressant, anti-anxiety and anti-insomnia medication increased significantly. We expect more symptoms um, in the terms of post-traumatic stress disorder in the next months. This will be not the last pandemic. Uh, I, I think there's a danger that uh, due to increased uh, population globally, that there would, could be a kind of a pull factor uh, for such pandemics so that we will see pandemics uh, happen in uh, more often than in the past. The vaccination st strategy for the future will be interesting. So uh, in Austria, we know there is around a 
vaccination rate for seasonal flu of only 8%, which is quite low. And I think there will be discuss the discussion uh, starting in the future uh, whether we will have a compulsory vaccination or we, we have to increase this uh, vaccination rate. It's too low. There will be available, hopefully, a COVID vaccination within the next month or uh, year, probably. And then I think we will have the discussion on the table. Will it be compulsory for the population? Um, it is very important in my eyes that uh, the, the approval process, process is very uh, clear and uh, uh, because uh, many people globally will get these vaccines. There will be ones from, from more than one supplier probably and uh, we have to avoid any side effects or long-term side effects. So on the one side, we have a big pressure on the authorities to accelerate the approval. On the other hand, I think we have to be very careful not to uh, release a vaccine which would not be safe on the long run. People like myself, we're immunosuppressed. And so anytime you go into any type of medical care establishment, you are at risk of catching something just because you are in that environment. And so we're seeing a lot more companies moving things like Remicade or even chemotherapy now into the home. Now take this one step further. We're seeing some of our giant payers, companies like Humana, they are moving chronic kidney care into the home, like late stage disease, things like dialysis, which is much more effective. And again, it, it dramatically cuts costs for everybody involved. It is so much cheaper for a patient to receive healthcare in their home than to have a brick and mortar establishment because hospitals cost a lot of money to run. And there was a big discussion going on, what would be the better choice? Let the politicians talk to the society or let the experts talk to the society? And this discussion is currently really going on on a level because um, uh, in our neighboring country, in, in Germany, it really runs uh, totally different to Austria. In Austria, all the communication is done by politicians, more or less, and in German, and in, in Germany, everything is done by experts, and they let just experts talk to the society, you know, on television, on radio, in the newspapers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Because, you know, all these information, you need to be informed to take your decision at the moment, either on the internet or on the, on the TV or whatever. Who should be the people, what do you think, you know, in the next period of time to make clear what needs to be done? Politicians are experts. Transparency and honesty, that's the key. It doesn't matter who does the uh, conversation, who communicates. What we're expecting is a transparent, honest appraisal, uh, raising hands if they go wrong, raising issues if they made errors, but asking the community to support them in that sense. And that's what's missing. Uh, and that's the problem that we're facing. We want honesty, transparency. I don't mind who communicates that, but that's the kind of what we expect as a public and a community. I had, I had this one last question was, I would be interested in on the health panel, whether you think that when vaccination, you know, for COVID-19 or for the SARS-CoV-2 virus or for Corona is already, you know, established probably at, I don't know, spring 2021, do you think that should be by choice or that should be, I don't know, um, compulsory, mandatory, whatever? I mean, probably everybody could give his opinion on that. <laughs> Do you think that under certain circumstances we should say there's a need for no discussion or is it all behavioral economics and we try it via nudging to convince people by communication that that would be a good idea? My viewpoint is let people make the choice to get the vaccine because the vast majority of us will, right? And that will be enough for herd immunity and, you know, why go against the, why fight against things? I mean, it's been shown that most of the anti-vax things are actually just coming out of Russia, right? So like they have kind of, um, you know, revved up the minority here in the United States. I don't know if you see a lot of anti-vax stuff in Europe, but it's still a, a tiny minority. And so really getting that herd immunity by most of us getting the vaccine should be good enough. Thank you all so much. Everyone who was on the, the health panel there, some fantastic stuff. Um, I got some really interesting things out of that. I think, um, Shafi said that, you know, this is a global pandemic. 
but we're not working globally on this. And I think that that's a really important thing that we actually break down those barriers. Seeing as the, this, uh, this virus doesn't have any barriers itself, uh, international barriers, then why are we leaving the international barriers up? Um, I think looking at the mental health as well, you know, that anxiety is increased and, and the, the amount of medication that, that the people are taking is going up and, and that's going to have an effect for years. That's really interesting. I'm, I'm really fascinated with what the long-term effects are um, and, and how with technology is creating a gap between the haves and have-nots and, and how as well employment, I guess, um, the, the people who have got the financial buffer are going to get out of this okay. The ones who don't have the financial buffer are the ones that are going to be impacted for years and how this virus is actually going to um, increase the gap between the rich and the poor, the haves and the have-nots.